Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our service. It's very nice to see you. Just going to commit this time to God in prayer, and then we will sing a hymn by Charles Wesley, And Can It Be That I Should Gain. Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you, Lord God, that it just seems such a paradox that you, a wonderful, loving God, should see anything in us. But we thank you, Lord God, that in your mercy, in your grace, you look beyond our sin because you've dealt with it. It was nailed to the cross. And thank you that we can celebrate that every day, the fact that, Lord God, you have demonstrated your power over sin and death, that you came to earth to live a perfect life, to prove that you are perfect, to prove that there's no corruption in you, that there is no darkness at all and that you were able to live a perfect life, and that upon yourself you took upon yourself our sin, our shame and our punishment, in order that we might be set free for those who accept the gift of your forgiveness and your salvation and the eternal life that you prove that you have and can give to us by rising again on the third day. So we bless your name, Lord, as we bring you our praise and our worship. We pray that we would be excited by the fact that uh, this life uh, is nothing compared to what you have in store for us forever. But we thank you, Lord God, that in this life we can know your presence, your forgiveness, your purpose, your joy, your presence. We ask, Lord God, that you would presence yourself among us now, that everybody know that peace that comes from you, the peace that passes all understanding that is in spite of our circumstances and anything that the world might throw at us, even what we, we might throw at ourselves. Thank you, Lord God, that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And Lord God, we bless your name and thank you for that truth. Amen. Amen. Shall we stand? We'll sing the hymn. And can it be? And can it be that I should again and it the Savior's blood, mighty for me, who pours his pain for me, who him to death pursued. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my This mystery of immortal eyes Who can explore his dreams design In vain the first born seraph tries To sound the depths of love divine Oh, 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 oh. 
cross bowed in sin and nature's mine. Thine I diffuse the quickening ray. I rose the dungeon flame with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose when born and followed thee. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose when born and followed thee. No condemnation. Jesus and Lord, in you is mine. And I live in my living hand, and clothed in righteousness divine. For I approached the eternal Please be seated for the reading, which will be brought by Sam. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah. So this morning's reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 11. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand by which also you are saved if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believe in va- believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once of whom the greater part remain to the present but some have fallen asleep after that he was seen by james then by all the apostles then last of all he was seen by me also as by one born out of due time for i am the least of the apostles who am i who am not worthy to be called an apostle because i persecuted the church of god But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. Should we stand if we're able? Your majesty, 
take our seats so Ian is going to lead us in prayer should we bow hello 
Dear Lord, we come before you, thankful for our health, but concerned for others struggling with their health. Lord, help us to help others. Lord, we come before you aware that this world that you created so beautifully, and yet realizing that there are people around us in pain. Lord, help us to be agent, agents of kindness, bringers of joy. Help us not to be critical of one another, but to be caring and concerned. Lord, we're grateful that your arm stretches out and reaches us in whatever place we are, whatever pain we're in, and whatever hurt or circumstance, your arm is long enough. Lord, where there is pain, bring kindness. Where there is hurt, bring healing. Where there is sadness, bring joy. Lord, cause us to walk as you walked. Cause us to live a life of compassion, motivated by our love for you, and therefore our willingness to love our neighbours and even our enemies. Lord, help us to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly, to be the salt and the light to one another, to this town and the world. In Jesus' name. Amen. We have a song to sing before then uh, Hamish speaks to us. Uh, the children, it's uh, Sunday school after this song, and it's under 12s only. So not everybody normally going to Sunday school. So uh, the older ones are going to stay in and hear Hamish. So shall we stand? Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is more. What love could remember the wrongs we have done? On his all knowing he counts not their son. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. What patience would wait as we constantly roam? What Father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. What riches of this he lavished on us. His blood was the payment, his life was the cost. We stood neath the debt we could never recall. Our sins, 
since they are many, His mercy is full. Praise the Lord, His mercy is full. Stronger the darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is full. Praise the Lord, His mercy is born. Stronger the darkness, you every one. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is born. Please take your seats. So if you're 12 and under, or under 12, I can't remember which, it's Sunday school. And for the rest of you, you've got Hamish. I'm already uh, paying the price slightly for my choice of breakfast uh, this morning. I think uh, where Sam had six fried eggs, I had six eggs of the Easter variety, um, <laughs> which is slightly cloying uh, in the mouth. But um, shall we open in prayer uh, and then we'll then we'll get going? Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this time that we have together this morning. Father, we thank you that we can gather together freely to bring you our praise and our worship and, and hear from your word. Just pray, Lord, that for each person here, that we would leave today knowing you just that little bit more, being changed that little bit more into your likeness. In your name we pray. Amen. On Monday, uh, we celebrated uh, one of the most important days on the calendar each year. Can anyone tell me what that was? April Fool's Day, Day, correct. (laughs) trick question to, uh, to kick us off. <laughs> April Fool's Day. It was a day uh, which I viewed with almost the same level of excitement as Christmas morning uh, when I was younger, uh, despite never really pulling off any, uh, any good ones myself. Uh, but over the years, there have been some, some pretty elaborate, uh, as well as some fairly ill-advised April Fool's Day pranks. Uh, for example, in 2015, the uh, Greater Manchester Police received quite a lot of uh, backlash <laughs> Uh, for posting an April Fool's Day tweet, which read, know someone in prison? You can get them released early by voting below. The prisoners with the most votes also win a holiday. Uh, And that joke didn't go down too well with the victims of crime in the area or the families of the prisoners. Uh, Very famously, the BBC pulled an April Fool's prank in 2013. Uh, They produced a short documentary, a black and white documentary, a very classic British narrator, Uh, and they were looking at a town called Ticino. Uh, The documentary followed the small town as they reaped a bountiful harvest of spaghetti from the spaghetti trees. Um, Some of my favorite lines from the clip include, many people are often puzzled by the fact that spaghetti is produced in such a uniform length, but this is the result of many years of patient endeavor by plant breeders who succeeded in producing the perfect spaghetti. Uh, the narrator also draws a contrast between the, uh, the vast spaghetti plantations, which I'm sure you've all seen in the Po Valley. But for the Swiss, however, it tends to be more of a family affair. It is two and a half minutes of great viewing if anyone is inclined to go and give it a watch. But to bring us to, uh, to a more serious note, I thought it was interesting this year that April Fool's Day also fell on Easter Monday. And I found it interesting because for the last 2,000 years, people have been pointing to the cross, people have been pointing to the resurrection of Jesus, and they've been trying to claim April Fools. They've been claiming that the resurrection didn't happen, that it was all some sort of elaborate hoax. They say, how could you fall for that? You don't really think that Jesus was raised from the dead, do you? 
And I'm sure all of us will have come across people who, whose reaction to the resurrection is to, to scoff. But in actual fact, the, the evidence for the resurrection is undeniable. And to, to anyone who would look, to anyone who would investigate, to anyone who would invest the time, they would come to that very same conclusion. Uh, Sir Lionel Luck, who was a world-renowned defense attorney, uh, and he's actually famous, has a place in the Guinness World Book of Records for achieving the most consecutive acquittals in defense murder trials with a remarkable streak of 245 victories in a row. And he wrote, I have spent more than 42 years as a defense trial lawyer, appearing in many parts of the world, and I'm still in active practice. I've been fortunate to secure a number of successes in jury trials. And I say unequivocally, the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so overwhelming that it compels acceptance by proof which leaves absolutely no room for doubt. 245 consecutive wins at murder trials. This is a man who knows what good evidence looks like. This is a man who knows how to analyze data and draw conclusions. And this is not a man who would be fooled by an elaborate April Fool's hoax. He looked at the evidence, he analyzed, and he drew his conclusion. And his conclusion was that the evidence for the resurrection was so overwhelming that there was no room for doubt. And in our passage uh, in 1 Corinthians this morning, which I sprung on Sam about half an hour ago, Paul presents the facts and he lays out the evidence for the resurrection. In verse 3, we read, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. And he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve, and then by over five hundred. And so this morning, I want to spend some time exploring some of the evidence for the resurrection. So that when we come across these people who, who try to claim April Fools, when, when people try to dismiss the resurrection as a hoax, we're equipped to give them an answer. We're equipped to, to ask questions, to present evidence that may lead them on the next step to following Jesus. And so the, uh, the first piece of evidence that I want to look at this morning is this, a confirmed death, but an empty tomb. A confirmed death, but an empty tomb. Uh, a couple of months ago, we looked at the evidence for Jesus' very existence, which is uh, often a throwaway line that we might encounter uh, from people who are looking to dismiss Jesus. Uh, we looked at evidence from sources outside of the Bible, from Ro Roman and Jewish historians who all mentioned Jesus in their writings, many of whom were actually very anti-Jesus, which supports the case even further as they had no reason or motive to promote him. But next on, on the list of throwaway objections, and I'm not sure if you've come across this, I, I certainly have, um, we might expect something along the lines of, well, maybe Jesus didn't actually die on the cross. Maybe he didn't die. And so, so when, he appeared to, when he appeared, everyone thought he was resurrected uh, and then the whole movement began. And there are many reasons why, why this doesn't hold weight. Um, firstly, because Jesus was in the hands of Roman soldiers. Now, Roman soldiers, they had a reputation for brutality. They were highly trained professionals with expertise in all things death. It's estimated that, that tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people were executed under the rule, the, the rule of the Roman Empire. Rome were experts in three things, straight roads, aqueducts, and death. And so when Jesus is handed over for crucifixion, He's being handed over to some of the most effective killers in history. And I think when we, when we read about the soldiers' involvement, this immediately becomes clear to us. In Mark chapter 15, we read, the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium, and they called together the whole garrison, and they clothed him with purple, and they twisted a crown of thorns, put it on his head, and began to salute him. Hail, King of the Jews. Then they struck him on the head with a reed and spat on him and bowing the knee, they worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took the purple off him, put his own clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. To humiliate and to mock someone 
that you're in the process of executing requires a level of cruelty that can only be formed by years and years of practice, years and years of hardening the conscience. When we read these words, these are not the actions of first time executioners. These are the actions of seasoned killers. And they hung Jesus on the cross. They drove six inch nails into his hands and to his feet, leaving him to die a slow death from suffocation. And in order to take a breath, Jesus would have had to have pushed himself up from his pierced feet to allow his lungs to fill with air. And it was a horrible and agonizing death. But the Jewish leaders were in a hurry. Uh, and we read in John chapter 19, therefore, because it was the preparation day that the bodies should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken. And that means that they could no longer push themselves up to take a breath and that they might be taken away. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified and his testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth so that you may believe. That's John saying, I was there. I saw this with my own eyes. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. The Roman soldiers, expert killers, they looked on Jesus and declared him dead. And these men knew death when they saw it. And rather than break his legs, they, they thrust a spear into his side. Uh, this was in fulfillment of, uh, of prophecies that we, that we find in Exodus, uh, that none of his bones would be broken, which was written 1,500 years before the crucifixion. And Zechariah, written 500 years before, that they would look on him whom they pierced. Researching the, the death of Jesus on the cross, uh, an article in the Journal of the American Medical Society concluded, clearly the weight of the historical and medical evidence indicates that Jesus was dead before the wound to his side was inflicted and supports the traditional view that the spear probably perforated not only the right lung, but also the pericardium and heart and thereby ensured his death. Accordingly, Interpretations based on the assumption that Jesus did not die on the cross appear to be at odds with modern medical knowledge. Jesus' death on the cross was confirmed, and yet the tomb was empty. And the empty tomb is a critical piece of evidence in the case for the resurrection. If Jesus' body was found, then clearly there could have been no resurrection. Anyone who's uh, still contending that, that Jesus didn't die holds a, an interesting position that in his beaten and crucified state, he was still able to escape the tightly wrapped grave clothes, which would have been loaded with about 35 kilograms of spices, uh, following which he staggered over and shifted the boulder at the entrance to the tomb, which was estimated to weigh several tons, uh, then escaped the Roman guards, again, bear in mind his condition, uh, following which he then presented to himself to the, the disciples as a resurrected saviour. Um, and I think when you picture his condition, it's safe to say this wouldn't be the triumphant resurrection that would inspire them to launch a worldwide movement. I think we can safely discount that one. Uh, others suggest that in actual fact, it was the disciples who came uh, and stole the body, uh, which we can similarly discount. When we read the accounts of the, of the disciples, we see that they're hiding, they're, they're living in fear. They're expecting a rest, they're, they're, down, they're downcast, downtrodden. And again, to, to, to steal the body, the disciples would have had to firstly get past the guards, which is an offense punishable by death for a Roman soldier. Then to roll away the stone, weighing several tons, with, again, without the guards realizing. Then steal and conceal the body also knowing for the rest of their lives exactly what it was that they had done. And every single one of the apostles faced intense persecution for proclaiming the resurrection. All of the apostles, apart from John, were killed defending the resurrection as a fact. See, people will die for what they know to be the truth. People will not die 
for what they know to be a lie. And all the apostles, apart from John, were killed for proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus. Not one of them changed their story. The religious leaders, the Romans, all they had to do, all they had to do was produce a body. Produce the body of Jesus and this all goes away. The resurrection is disproven. Christianity is finished before it has even begun. But they didn't because they couldn't because there was no body. We read it in Matthew 28. Now, while they were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all the things that had happened. When they had, when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers saying, tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. Jesus was confirmed dead. The disciples could not have stolen the body. The Romans didn't have it. The priests were attempting to cover it up because they didn't have it either. The resurrection is the only explanation that stands up to scrutiny. In Luke 24, we read, he is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee saying, the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. In fulfillment of biblical prophecy, proving himself to be the son of God with the power over sin and death, Jesus rose from the dead. And the confirmation of his death and the empty tomb are key pieces of evidence in the case for the resurrection. Uh, secondly, we have eyewitness testimony, which was affirmed to the grave. Now, there are two things that I want to focus on as we look at the, the eyewitness testimonies. Firstly, we have the, the number of eyewitnesses involved. Uh, and secondly, who those eyewitnesses were. See, in our passage in 1 Corinthians, Paul is providing a list of people who saw the resurrected Jesus. And he's calling them by name. In verse 6, he also tells us that the majority of the 500 people who Jesus appeared to were in fact still alive at the time of writing. So he's inviting people to go and speak with them. He's inviting people to go and corroborate the facts. This is not something that you would do if you, if you suspected that there might be some weak links in the 500 who wouldn't be going along with the party line. You would only invite this kind of scrutiny if the facts were true. Paul lists Peter, the disciples, James, the crowd of 500 and himself all as key witnesses to the resurrection. 515 eyewitnesses. That's a lot of people and I'll prove it to you. If we were to hold a trial uh, in Cleveland Family Church this morning on the question of whether or not Jesus returned from the dead, if we were to call each of the 515 witnesses to give an account of their encounter with Jesus, and we were to give each of them 15 minutes, 15 minutes to give an account of their encounter with Jesus, if we did that around the clock, 24 hours a day, no breaks for food or any other such breaks, we'd be interviewing witnesses for over five days straight. Five days straight. And after listening to 128 hours of eyewitness accounts, how many people would leave here unconvinced of Jesus's resurrection? The number and the quality of the, the eyewitnesses is unprecedented. But what about the people to whom the eyewitness testimony belonged? Not the best and the brightest, not people of power and influence, not leaders with a, a large platform and a, and a big following. They were fishermen, they were, they were tax collectors, men of, of little or no repute, men who weren't known for, for composing great speeches that would stir up a crowd and, and gather a following. Average, ordinary people. And it's also significant that the first sources to proclaim the resurrection are the women who visited the tomb. Dr. William Lane Craig tells us that women's testimony in this day and age was regarded as so worthless that they weren't even allowed to serve as legal witnesses in a Jewish court of law. In light of this, it's absolutely remarkable that the chief witnesses to the empty tomb are these women. 
I think this can be uh, quite difficult for us to get our, our heads around in this day and age, but um, I can give us a good example to, to illustrate. A few weeks ago, uh, I was in Northern Ireland uh, shopping for a wedding suit with Hannah, because um, apparently it's not, a bad, it's not bad luck to see a groom in his wedding suit before the big day. I tried on uh, some really nice suits and we managed to narrow it down to two, uh, one which I really liked and one which Hannah really liked. I can see, you, see, you, you can see where this is going. <laughs> if we'd been living 2000 years ago, this would have been an absolute shoe in for me. <laughs> Hannah's opinion actually wouldn't have counted and we would have gone with the one which I preferred. But we live in a different world. <laughs> <laughs> After <laughs> that's not the that's not the part that you're supposed to amen, Rebecca. <laughs> After discussing it further, uh, we reached a compromise uh, and went with the one which Hannah preferred. Um, <laughs> but if you were writing a, a fictional account in an attempt to deceive people, you would not have chosen Mary, Mary Magdalene, and the other women as your first sources. You'd have chosen leaders, you'd have chosen kings, priests, men with power and influence. And the fact that the first sources to proclaim the resurrection are women is another indication that the gospel writers were committed to recording exactly the facts, exactly what took place, even though in this instance, the historical truth doesn't help their case. The number of, of eyewitnesses the fact that these were the testimonies of ordinary people who were transformed by the resurrection is evidence of the truth of the resurrection. And that brings us to our, our final piece of evidence for, for today, which is the explosion of the early church. The explosion of the early church. It was at a time where there was nothing to gain socially, politically or culturally, and in fact, everything to lose as Christians faced some of the worst persecution imaginable. They faced ridicule, arrest, torture, death. Look at the transformation of the disciples. They had scattered in the Garden of Gethsemane, deserting Jesus. And after the crucifixion, we, we find them hiding in Jerusalem. In John chapter 20, we read, the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, and the Greek word here implies shot, shut and locked, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said, peace be with you. From running scared in the garden to hiding in a locked room, fearing for their lives, these are the very same men who would carry the message of the resurrected Jesus across the Middle East, across Europe, across Africa, Asia, they went global proclaiming Jesus as the Messiah. They went global proclaiming the truth of the resurrection. They went from running scared and hiding, and hiding to boldly sharing the message, knowing that they would be persecuted and face death for doing so. Emperor after emperor of, of, the, uh, of the Roman Empire killed Christians e even just for sport in the Colosseums. None worse than Nero who actually burned Christians alive as human torches to light the streets of Rome. If the message was not true, if the message of the resurrection did not have the power to transform hearts and lives, then such persecution and such rejection would have snuffed it out. But the word of God does have the power to transform hearts and lives. In Hebrews 4, we read the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The word of God, the, the gospel message of Jesus, who died to pay the price for all the wrong things that we've done, who rose again, who was resurrected to prove that he had the power over sin and death. That is a message that has the power to transform hearts and lives. And it did so then in the face of such intense persecution and it continues to do so today even in parts of the world where again Christians are facing such similar levels of persecution and rejection. If it had been cool, if it had been in to be a Christian we could have made, maybe explained how the message went global but the fact that the church exploded so rapidly despite unpopularity 
despite the fact its members face such persecution. This is evidence of the truth of the message. So to draw us to a close, history's unanimous testimony is that Jesus died and that on Easter morning, the tomb was empty. There was no motive for the, the Jewish authorities or the Romans, and they couldn't produce the body. The disciples could not have stolen the body. The number and the quality of the eyewitness accounts verifies the truth of the message. The explosion of the early church in the face of such persecution, despite efforts to, to stamp it out and persecute its followers, that speaks to the truth of the message. The only explanation that fits the facts is that Jesus is who he says he is, the son of God, and that he really did rise from the dead. And what does that mean for, for you and me? Well, Paul goes on in 1 Corinthians 15 to say, the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. The sting of death, that's the thing that makes death something to be feared, is sin, because sin separates us from God. And the strength of sin is the law, because the law reveals what sin is, but while it highlights our need for salvation, it doesn't provide our salvation. <clears throat> Verse 57, but, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. God has given us the victory over sin and death. Jesus conquered sin and death and he proved it by the resurrection. He proved that death had no power over him. Therefore, when he says that we have the victory over sin and death, we can believe him because he demonstrated it. Because he lives we do not need to fear death. Because he lives, we can face the future. We can face the, the coming days, weeks, months, years. And we can face them with confidence, knowing that because Jesus was resurrected, our eternal future is secure in him. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for, for the truth of your word. We thank you. Father, for sending your son Jesus to the earth to, to die on the cross in our place. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us the victory over sin and death, Lord, that we look forward to our eternal future with you. Lord, we could never have earned it. We didn't deserve it, but you paid it all in our place. We give you the thanks and the praise. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Hamish. Should we stand together if we're able to? And we'll sing that hymn, Because He Lives, I Can Face Tomorrow. God sent His Son they called him Jesus, he came to love, heal and forgive, he bled and died, to buy my pardon, an empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know, I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives.
child's feet to hold. A newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he is, but greater still. The calm assurance the child can face a certain days because he lives, because he lives. I can face tomorrow because he lives. Oh, fear is gone because I know, I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives. And then one day, I'll cross that river, I'll find life's final war with pain. And then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the light of glory and I'll know he reigns because he lives. I can face tomorrow because he lives. Oh, fear is gone because I know, I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. Please take your seats. Our steward is going to lead us in communion. I wonder if... Um, Jackie Wright, where is Jackie? There's Jackie. If you could just come here, and uh, Isabella, Levi, where's Jack? Jack, if you could come here and help. And we have four. Took me a while. I read, not with surprise, but with real disappointment, that. Bristol Cathedral opened its doors for the celebration of Iftar, which is not a Christian religion or religious celebration. It's somewhere else, it's just letting other people in. But what we've heard this morning is that we celebrate Almighty God's greatest gift, as Hamish has outlined to us this morning. We follow Jesus Christ, his son, who was killed, as Hamish said, provenly beyond a shadow of a doubt, who rose up from the grave without a shadow of a doubt. And that's why we're here this morning. That's why we're going to look this morning in our hearts and examine ourselves in the face of his wonderful sacrifice. Once final for us all. Praise God this morning that Jesus died and that he rose again. Shall we bow our heads and just prepare our hearts? Dear God, we thank you for the fact of your presence on earth, the record of your sinless life, of the fact that you made the blind to see, the infirm to walk, even raised the dead. And then at Calvary paid the price for our sins and rose up in order that we might have life with you. Dear God, we thank you for the cross. We thank you that you were broken for us, poured out. And that you have given us that opportunity to be part of your family. We celebrate that, dear God, this morning in this place. Pray, dear God, that you will forgive us of our sins, cleanse us from unrighteousness. We ask it in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Should we just stay with our heads bowed? Just examine ourselves this morning. There are ways in which we've let God down. And perhaps unlike other religions, we shouldn't tell ourselves that's fine. We should actually acknowledge it's not fine. And that we want to change, to be like him. Unforgiveness, jealousy, anger, all of these things. We want to take on the likeness of Christ. That's why he died. Jesus has given us this opportunity to remember the fact that his body was broken for us. Jesus took the bread in front of his friends and he broke it. He said, this is my body which is broken for you. And after supper, he took the wine. He said, this is my blood, it's a covenant. This is the form of a covenant with you. Isn't it great that he has written a covenant in his own blood that we can take full confidence in. Praise God. stand before your throne, dressed in glory, not my own. Was it joy I'll sing of on that day? No more tears or broken dreams, forgotten is the minor key. Everything as it was meant to be. And we will worship, worship forever in your presence. We will sing, we will worship, worship you, an endless hallelujah to the King. I will see you as you are, love you with unseeing heart, see how much you pay to bring me home. 
Not till then, Lord, shall I know. Not till then, how much I owe. Everything I am before your throne. We will worship, worship forever in your presence. We will sing, we will worship, worship you and endless hallelujah to the No more tears, no more shame, no more sin and sorrow ever, not again. No more fears, no more pain, we will see you face to face. See you face to face. Should we stand before we're able to? We'll start from the beginning with verse one. When I stand before your throne. When I stand before your throne, dressed in glory, not my own. What a joy I'll sing of on that day. No more tears or broken dreams, forgotten is the minor key. Everything as it was meant to be. And we will worship, worship. Forever in your presence, we will sing, we will worship, worship you, and endless hallelujah to the King. I will see as you are. I will see you as you are. Love you with unseeing heart. See how much you paid to bring me home. Not till then, Lord, shall I know. Not till then, how much I owe. Everything I am before your throne, and we will worship, worship forever in your presence. We will sing, we will worship, worship you. An endless hallelujah to the King. No more tears. No more tears. No more shame. No more sin and sorrow ever known again. No more fears. No more pain. We will see you face to face, see you face to face. And we will And this 
Yes, hallelujah, to believe. And we will worship, worship forever in your presence. We will sing, we will worship, worship you. An endless hallelujah to the King. An endless hallelujah to the King. An endless hallelujah to the King. Thank you, Lord God, for your presence. Thank you that we have been able to gather together to bring our praise, to say hallelujah. Bless your name. Thank you for all the wonderful things you've done for us. Praise you, Lord. You are wonderful. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Please take your seats. I just have a few announcements uh, to run through. Um, there is no lift this afternoon. Is that correct? I think, yeah, Sarah's recovering. So it's no lift and there is no illuminate. That's the oldest. So junior youth, senior youth, you have got an evening off and then we crack on next week. Uh, we're going to have a barbecue for the illuminate uh, older ones next Sunday evening at 7.30. Let me know early if you're coming so that we can make sure we get enough catering in for that. Um, turning then to tomorrow, I think we've got a normal, um, a normal week now after... No, it's half, is it still half term? Wow. You can tell I'm old and all my children have grown up. <laughs> is there football tomorrow night? There is football tomorrow night down at the school. Tuesday morning, come for coffee between 10 and 12. We're meeting here uh, also in the evening at 7.30 for about an hour, time of fellowship, prayer, praise, and a look at God's word at the end. Um, Wednesday morning, is the ladies group on? No ladies group Wednesday morning. There's no men's group Wednesday morning. Is there choir on Wednesday evening? Yes, there is here at seven o'clock. If you're not a part of the choir and you'd like to join, please have a chat with Holly, who's on the keyboards to my right. Uh, is there the ladies' Bible study on Thursday? No, that's the 24th, I think. 18th, that's correct. <laughs> I was guessing. Um, and normal services uh, next Sunday. Can I just say as well, thank you to everybody who contributed last Sunday to a wonderful Easter Sunday service. It was different than we normally do, but we had some people who came in who don't normally come because their children came. Um, so right the way through from Lyft children who participated to the Illuminate, to young people, um, there were some absolute blinders played with uh, fancy dress outfits and people played their part. And I just thought it was really excellent. Great script, a great witness, and it had real impact. So uh, too many people to thank. So thank all of you uh, for the way in which you helped make that happen. It was brilliant. We should do it every week. Sorry? Oh, yes, sorry. Um, so there's some cake at the back of church afterwards. It's Mummy and Daddy's 60th wedding anniversary. Um, better stand up. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Doesn't happen often because I didn't know what it would be when it's 60, but it's diamond. <laughs> so it's their diamond wedding anniversary. So we're going to celebrate that afterwards together with some fellowship, some cake. So please stick around if you can and say hello before you have to dash off. Right, children, um, Jack is going to hand out some weaponry. If you'd like to help <laughs> with our closing song, we'll sing Celebrate Jesus Celebrate. It's a real Easter one. I love this. And uh, we'll take the offering as we sing. Stand if you are able. Ready? Get in time. Here we go. 
Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. He is risen. Celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. He is risen, he is risen, and he lives forevermore. The resurrection of our He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. And He lives forevermore. He is risen. We'll do it one more time. Celebrate Jesus, celebrate. say the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Sorry? <laughs> I think it's